Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please do check our content out as you are on YouTube, but also it's available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. Like, subscribe, and add a comment, because that's incredibly important these days to help the algorithm find and rank our content, which of course allows people to discover the amazing speakers that we feature on the channel. Please also check out the validated Ukrainian charities in the description. They are doing extraordinary work with civilians and some are rehabilitating uh, military service people, especially those who have lost limbs. It's incredibly important at this time that that work can continue. Scott Lucas is a political analyst with more than 30 years experience, including a wide range of interests from academic expertise to journalism and public media, as well as digital engagement. Scott is a regular contributor to international TV, radio and other outlets. He's currently a professor at the Clinton Institute, University College Dublin and a professor emeritus at the University of Birmingham. Just checking, Scott, that, that is still correct. That was correct a year ago. Are those details still accurate? Absolutely spot on. Fantastic. Well, we're going to jump straight into the topics here. We're going to, I think, range sort of, it might seem all over the place, but there will be some uh, method in the madness, I hope, as well, because we last caught up more than a year ago, and there's been an extraordinary change, um, not only on the world scene, but also in the atmosphere. Uh, those who are supportive of Ukraine, were perhaps far more optimistic uh, this time last year. Uh, Ukraine was making decisive uh, successes in terms of taking land, which is something the media very much pays attention to. It has other successes this year, but they largely go under-reported, including its successes in the Black Sea. But we've had other things bubbling up, including, of course, the terror attacks in Israel and the operation by the IDF in Gaza that has followed. But that's just one of many conflagrations that seem to be popping up and uh, sort of taking up the oxygen, as it were, that uh, Ukraine previously occupied in the media. What's your assessment of that move from, I'd say, relative optimism to a, a degree of pessimism? And Jonathan, thank you so much for having me back. I mean, you do such great work here. Uh, in terms of who you bring in and all these discussions you have, and you sort of cut through a lot of white noise, which I think is, is my starting point here, which is, you know, there's a lot of white noise, and it's understandable around, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and where we've gone in the past year. Um, some of that white noise, of course, is spurred by those who wish to spread propaganda about it, you know, put out talking points, uh, whether it's on behalf of the Kremlin or, let's be honest, sometimes on behalf of Kyiv. Um, and some of that white noise may be well-intentioned, but it it's, comes from not really reading the fact, and this is the first of my two starting points, that the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, we're dealing with a marathon, not a sprint, right? You know, and uh, that, I think, led people to overestimate when Ukraine launched the counteroffensive last June and said, well, this is it. This is going to be the victory. This will be the liberation of the territory. And if this, if this fails, well, that means Ukraine has failed, which... Uh, is not true because the second point, I'm just gonna reiterate this because I don't think people think about it. Almost exactly two years ago, um, so in February, 2022, on the night that Russia attacked all across Ukraine, not just a ground invasion, but with the air attacks, trying to land the special forces just outside of Kyiv, I was doing a podcast with a lot of military experts and almost in fact it was unanimous there, to a person everyone expected Kiev to fall within days not week, not even months not weeks but days that's where they fall you know we were what we were listening to reports come in that you know the russian special forces were trying to take hostile uh Hostimel airport outside Kiev. they would use that as a launch pad to go in they get rid of the Zelensky government and then they put in a puppet government and you know they would rule the country they would effectively annex all of it and it was that night that Vladimir Zelensky showed up with a few of his ministers around him in the darkness in Kyiv and gave this defiant response, which said, you know, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. Kyiv still stands. In fact, most of Ukraine, more than 80% of it, still stands, not just withstanding the Russian occupation, but is unoccupied. And indeed, Kyiv not only stands, but 
it has been able to regain some territory uh, on the ground, despite the limited games of the counteroffensive from last year. And it is now hitting Russia well beyond the front lines, including inside Russia itself. So if you took, you know, if you go from February 2022, would you expect that? Would you actually expect that we still would be talking about an independent Ukraine fighting back against a Russia, which has a vast advantage in manpower, which has a vast advantage in military hardware, especially artillery, even with the aid that Ukraine has received? Would you expect that? And so for all those out there who take the snap headlines here in February 2024 and say, not just Ukraine is losing or stalemate, frozen conflict, that's white noise. And it's destructive white noise at times. So let's get to an honest reading of what is occurring right now. The honest reading right now on the ground is that in terms of the battlefield, uh, neither Ukraine nor Russia is likely to make significant gains in the near future. Ukraine has shifted to what they call active defense. They will try to regain territory if an opportunity presents itself, but the Russians have built up their defense lines in the east and in the south. Russia has tried for months to regain just a single town in the Donetsk region in Ukraine, eastern Ukraine, Avdivka. And Avdivka could finally fall in the next few weeks. It's completely devastated, kind of about 34,000 people. The Russians would take it. It's not an unimportant position, but it's not a vital position. So for the Russians to expend and to take tens of thousands of casualties and to lose a significant amount of armor just to take one down, anybody expects them to sweep across Ukraine? Look, Vladimir's first phase of the Ukraine invasion, which was to win on the battlefield, that was long gone. He failed on that. So let's talk about second phase. Let's talk about what's happening then in terms of uh, what might be called the food war and then the control of the Black Sea. Um, your folks, viewers will remember that back in the summer of 2022, uh, or spring, summer of 2022, the whole idea was to break Ukraine by blockading the ports. Didn't work. I mean, there was a UN sanctioned deal to keep the ports open to an extent, but here we are in 2024. And not only are the ports opened up, but Ukraine has actually broken the Russian grip on part of the Black Sea, on the Western Black Sea. Uh, there's a protected corridor now, and Ukraine's uh, food exports of foods, grains, other essentials from its ports is now greater than it was in February 2022. And it surpassed that level. Uh, the Russian uh, naval, the Black Sea Fleet has suffered a series of damaging attacks by Ukrainian drones, by Ukrainian missiles, by Ukrainian saboteurs um, on warships, on port facilities, on the Black Sea headquarters, as well as on other installations in Crimea, such as oil and ammunition. Posts. So that food war Vladimir Putin has not succeeded and is unlikely to be renewed. We talk about the third phase, talk about the energy war. So that's the winter of 2022-2023. Half of Ukraine's grid at one point knocked offline by, you know, the incessant attack, sometimes with more than 100 missiles, and then the Iran-made drones. That grid was repaired in spring of 2023, and it still largely functions. Now, the Russians still, almost on a daily basis, do attack with missiles, do attack with drones, but not to the same intensity, not to the same intensity that occurred during those few months over the winter, so we're coming out of the winter of 2023, 24, and we're not talking about Ukraine's energy infrastructure being broken. That's being taken down. So Putin fails with the energy war on that point. And if anything, what you've seen is, is that Russia's energy sector is under a great deal of pressure because of the international sanctions that's forced them to look for other customers to get what they would consider a fair return in terms of their oil and their gas. And, and so what you really work to is you work towards a fourth phase in 2024, which is where the white noise comes, after, comes back into play, because it's, it, it's it's not even an information war, because a lot of it is propaganda, misinformation, disinformation, but that's where the battle's being fought, because Putin's play here is, guys, guys, why are y'all spending so much on supporting Ukraine? You, you know they're going to lose, you're wasting your money, take care of your populations at home, you know, you know they're Nazis, you know that they really, you know, are, are, which, you know, are not worthy of being in NATO or in the EU, so you know, just just leave them. And that 
Kremlin campaign, wittingly or unwittingly, is supported by a lot of activists uh, outside of Russia, including activists in the UK, in Europe, in the United States. I'll name names if you want. I was on um, an Al Jazeera's Inside Story with one of them a few days ago. And those activists, wittingly or unwittingly, are really in a position where they're happy to erase Ukrainians and they're happy to erase Kyiv. Even if they say Vladimir Putin is not a nice guy or a war criminal, they will parrot the false narrative that Putin, and this is to use the exact words, the exact words of the effective apologist who was on air with me a few days ago on Al Jazeera Inside Story, that Putin was baited and provoked into invading Ukraine. You know, baited and provoked into carrying out two years of assault, carrying out war crimes, carrying out the killings of tens of thousands of civilians, the deportations of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, including tens of thousands of children. He was baited and provoked into that. You know the narrative. Your viewers probably know the narrative. But it is vital now because let me, let's me let give two specific fronts that we talk about. One front that you talk about where, where Putin wants to break this is he wants to break EU support and more broadly European support for NATO. Now, uh, sorry, for NATO, for Ukraine. Now, again, in, in February 2022, could you have anticipated that Finland would be a member of NATO, that Sweden will be on the brink of, of joining NATO? And I think it now will happen, despite uh, uh, Mr. Erdogan in Turkey and Mr. Orban in Hungary playing politics. I think the way is now paved where by the spring, uh, Sweden will be in NATO. You're talking about an EU that has set up a path to accession for Ukraine and indeed, importantly, for the neighboring country of Moldova, um, which is a country that Russia's tried to break apart since the 1990s. Um, you know, who would have expected that? But what you have, and you have to be honest here, is, is that we had the prospect of a Putin ally within the EU. Uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who until very recently, was maintaining a veto on Ukraine's accession uh, or the negotiations to starting Ukraine's accession to the EU. He finally gave that up last month. And then a few days ago, uh, he gave way. He gave way on the EU's 50 billion euro fund for financial and economic assistance to Ukraine through 2027. For weeks, he had said he would not give way. For weeks, he said this would not be possible. So, and he kept, there were minor, and I mean really minor concessions the EU gave. So Orban could save a bit of face, but he went away. So Putin failed with Orban to break the EU's financial and economic support. And it didn't happen accidentally, did it? I mean, again, the surprise is the EU finally played a form of hardball. They called his bluff. And, uh, you know, it, it's worked. And that seems to be the interesting lesson here that Putin will push and push and push either directly or through proxies, through informational warfare, lawfare, aggression, whatever it happens to be, he'll push until he comes up to a hard will to resist. And he won't, then he won't fight that. He'll go and he'll, you know, like water, he'll try to find another way or gas. He'll find another way to try and, you know, worm its way in. It's taken so long, though, for people to learn that lesson. It's only half learned, I suspect, at the moment. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll get to the second front, which is not, is actually more dangerous right now. But that first front, the European Korean front, um, it's an important success. And it is a success because European leaders, far more than, again, a lot of the media, as well as activists, knew what Orban wants is attention. Orban wants an attention. He wanted to be the, and he's very similar to Erdogan, Turkey's Erdogan in this respect. He wanted to be the guy that looked like, okay, I can call the shots in terms of whether or not this happens or not. And they finally, this past week, said, no, okay, you, you've run your course now, son. Um, and I won't go into the full details of how they really boxed Orban in. But here's the key. It was a collective effort. It was uh, Italy's Georgia Maloney. And who would have expected this? Georgia Maloney, who I disagree with vehemently on a range of policies that we could talk about. I mean, she is a hard right leader. Um, she is a very dangerous leader on other policies, but she has proved to be a staunch defender of the EU and of the EU's position on Ukraine. Georgia Maloney said, no, I'm sorry. You might be a hard right leader like me, but I'm not giving you cover. Emmanuel Macron, who has been criticized for many for grandstanding at times and so on. He comes in and does his part, though, 
Germany's Olaf Scholz comes in and says, no, the line is going to be held. Then von der Leyen, Charles Michel, the EU's top officials, make it clear, no, you're not going to get tens of billions of euros from us through this stunt, at least not immediately. We're going to continue to hold up funding to Hungary, and we will find a way to get around your veto. That's the other thing that happened that took place. There is a broader European campaign being waged, however, because remember, with the EU, we're talking about financial and economic assistance. Military assistance has to come through individual European countries, largely. The EU is not set up to give military assistance on, on that point. And again, Putin's trying to get countries to, to pull back, to not give supplies here. And there is a critical uh, issue regarding artillery shells here. The EU, sorry, European countries have largely stood together in terms of their intention to deliver the artillery shells. They haven't been able to ramp up production enough. They wanted to supply a million artillery shells by March. They're only going to get about 520,000, which is why there is this choke point on the battlefield. We can't come back to that if you want, because where that military dimension comes in is, is in the U.S. And that's where we've got the real threat now, and that's where we've got Putin's opportunity that's taking place. As I speak to you, uh, a group of Republicans, Republicans, uh, there's sort of different elements in this group. Some of them are Trumpists, uh, and Donald Trump does not want to help Ukraine. Donald Trump wants to blackmail Ukraine like he did in 2019. So those Trumpists all the way back in October said, we're not going to allow the Biden administration to get $60 billion in budgetary authority, much of which would go to military aid. Then there's a second faction of Republicans who came in and said, all right, we're going to play blackmail with the Ukraine aid um, until we get concessions over fairly punitive border measures on the U.S.-Mexican border. And then there's a third group of Republicans who are just scared of their own damn shadow. And with an election coming up in 2024 for many congressional seats, they're scared to make a move uh, that might defy Trump and incur his wrath. So all that has meant that a minority of the Republican Party in Congress is holding up and has held up this assistance, this military assistance. And Putin's going to encourage this. He's going to encourage this by whipping up attack lines through U.S. media. Um, and, well, Tucker Carlson, a guy you might remember, Jonathan, he used to work for Fox News until they finally got rid of him. He's in Russia this week. I wonder what he could be doing there. And that, that's that's an extraordinary detail there, isn't it? He was uh, pictured at the Bolshoi Ballet. I'm sure that was just uh, one of, of many engagements. He's supposedly interviewed inverted commas because there's nothing journalistic about this enterprise it is a pure mm. uh propaganda exercise he apparently uh sat down with putin for a three-hour conversation um mm. you know the likelihood of finding any truth or any useful information in that three hours uh you know i i'm not i'm not going to sign up to listen actually to that i might view a transcript but hearing their two voices would be uh, beyond intolerable i think um but this you know in a previous age uh, in a sort of reaganite era this surely would be grounds for sedition uh, not just the usual kind of uh, you know gameplay uh, of of sort of washington politics in a previous Reagan era, there would be no question in terms of what we're doing regarding the, the position of what you do if, if Russia has invaded one of its neighbors, or the, then the Soviet Union had invaded one of its neighbors. Um, we can talk about the complexities of what happened over Afghanistan, but there is a fundamental difference here, which is, and I hate, but there's a hierarchy here. Afghanistan's in Asia, Ukraine in Europe, right? But, and this is going to lead me to the wider element of the second threat. So the European threat, talk about the second threat, which is the threat in the United States. Is, this isn't Reagan's Republican Party. It hasn't been for some, there are some who are Reagan's, but this is a split party. It's fractured. It's almost crumbling as we watch it because a guy named Donald Trump, uh, a guy who, a reminder, tried to launch a coup uh, just over three years ago to stay in power. A guy who is a found guilty of sexual assault Indeed, the judge supervising the case, Lewis Kaplan, said it was tantamount to rape. That was in the civil uh, cases brought by Eugene Carroll. Uh, he has been found guilty of fraud 
in the civil cases, um, initially against the Trump organization, and now the ongoing case where the amount of damages is going to be settled uh, in New York State. He is facing 91 felony charges, uh, serious charges regarding interference in the 2016 election, regarding uh, the theft of classified documents, regarding the attempt to overturn the 2020 election, which is linked, of course, to the incitement of violence in the Capitol attack of January 21. I list all of that because it is quite likely that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee for the White House. And he has a, a, a good chance of becoming the president. And of course, that's Putin's salvation. This is Putin's life raft. Because if Trump comes in, and your viewers will remember, this is the man who does not have any type of coherent approach to U.S. foreign policy, to U.S. military policy. His only allegiance is to what he thinks is good for Donald Trump. And in the uh, June, July of 2019, that was the blackmail of Ukraine, withholding military aid, when Russia was already putting pressure on Ukraine, already had seized part of the East, already had seized Crimea. Blackmailing Ukraine, you don't get military aid until you dish dirt on Joe Biden. Now, the American system held at that point, thanks to a whistleblower who revealed the phone call, and Trump was impeached, although he was saved from conviction by the Republican majority in the Senate. When we get to 2024, and then if he wins the presidency from January 2025, Donald Trump has made it known as that he's going to wreak vengeance on his enemies from day one. And that will include Ukraine. Uh, I don't think, in other words, this is solely because Donald Trump is a vassal of Vladimir Putin. He admires Putin. He likes to get Putin's favor. He plays up to Putin. But this is a guy who also feels like he was uh, treated badly by Ukraine. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, I I think there is nothing but dark times ahead, it, which is why, to bring this full circle, that on the Ukraine issue and on a variety of other issues, economic, political, military issues, European leaders are already making contingency plans if, if Trump gets in the White House. And of course, Ukraine will also be making contingency plans. In fact, they probably have been for a number of months, uh, because this is this is a slow moving train wreck, isn't it? Uh, you know, the election and the possibility of what's going to happen. Dare I say, even if Biden does come in, you know, we we still may be faced with the same impasse behind aid. And even if that gets unblocked, of course, that will be positive. But there's also, dare I say, the deep level suspicion uh which which this is this is one i guess uh piece that's difficult to prove but which i have discussed on the channel is that even biden's team do not have a strategy for ukraine to win the suspicion is that behind the scenes they would prefer to see a frozen conflict where russia does not collapse with all the attendant nuclear risk etc and you have a fairly extreme version of escalation management going on which may be entirely fanciful i mean whether you can control what happens in russia or not i, I don't think that's with, really within the power of any western government no matter how much they think they may be able to fine-tune the situation to prevent its collapse uh, and disastrous defeat um it seems that there are a number of uh, almost sort of uh, a mixture of win-win. No, no, there's no win-win scenario on the table, but there are a variety of sort of win-lose or outright lose-lose scenarios that we're heading towards. I, before we get into that that grand question, um, yeah, I, I'm always one that that always tries to maintain an opening in terms of, of what could occur. So, you know, as we speak, um, the U.S. Senate, where there are more sensible Republicans, um, is uh, setting out the legislation for aid to Ukraine, reworking that $60.6 billion that Biden has requested for budget authorization for Ukraine, as well as budget authorization for support of Israel. Um, now, the problem, we'll see if it passes the Senate. The problem here is, is that uh, the House has a lot more Trumpist fire breathers and general wackos. Um, and the speaker of the house, the house speaker mike johnson who may tick all three of those boxes um, has said that any legislation which includes aid to ukraine 
even with the concessions over the border. Those have been negotiated with the Biden administration that it's, quote, dead on arrival. We'll see if that's all bluster. So in other words, there is a chance that the, the aid will go through in the next few weeks. And I, I, I wouldn't predict it would, but I think uh, it is an open question. Uh, the question of where we are in terms of more broadly uh, going into November 2024 and beyond is, let me raise an important point, which I can't see anyone noticing at this point, even the US media who have been led by the nose by the Trump spectacle, there's elections for the Senate and the House going on in November, folks. And both of those chambers of Congress are on a knife edge in terms of who has control. Uh, so, you know, it, it is possible that you could have a Democratic majority in both houses, not just the one that they have in the Senate, for January 2025. And that would change the dynamic regarding Ukraine because the Democrats are largely supportive of aid to Ukraine. It is possible that a lot of the more what I would consider establishment Republicans, middle of the road Republicans would win their House and Senate races and the Trumpists might lose them, which means you have a different type of Republican Party in Congress in 2025. No one seems to be paying attention to that, but it means it's an open question of where the U.S. is uh, less than a year from now. I mean, the Trump threat is a serious threat, but there are other pieces in the U.S. system. In terms of the Biden folks, I wouldn't go as far, and, and I can understand the frustration of people, and I can understand the concern that there would be folks within the Biden administration willing to sell Ukraine out um, in terms of allowing Russia to effectively uh, de facto hold on to annex the territory as they did with Crimea. I can understand the frustration of that, but I do think as an analyst, you have to start from the basis of this, and that is the American play has almost been throughout these two years, which is two things. First of all, they don't want to go in up front. They want to go in as part of a coalition in terms of the support for Ukraine. They don't want to be exposed up front to make it a U.S. versus Russia thing. And that's why, you know, and it's a reworking of that disastrous phrase that Obama used with Libya more than a decade ago, leading from behind. But it does mean that if you talk about, for example, when it was the move to providing armor to Ukraine, what did the Americans do? The Americans effectively wanted it to be German-made leopards that went in. And finally, the Americans effectively said, oh, yeah, we'll send Abrams tanks, knowing full well it was the leopards that were closer that could be delivered quicker, right? Then if you want to make the play in terms of the longer-range weapons, moving from, well, the medium-range uh, medium HIMARS rocket systems to the longer-range systems, uh, it was, again, you know, the Europeans can do this. We talk about the French scouts, talk about the British storm shadows that are making a big difference in the attacks on Russia, uh, on Russian facilities in Crimea and in Russia itself. And again, the Americans were sort of like, you know, you guys, you guys can do it. Same thing with war plan. Same thing, which is, all right, Europeans can deliver F-16s, U.S. made F-16s from their stocks. The Americans will replace those from stocks and they do it that way. The, the second thing the Americans were doing is they were going step by step, which is they didn't want to box Putin into a corner. It's not that they want, they prefer him to be in power. It's not like they think, you know, Russia implosions are more on that, but they didn't want to jack this up to a confrontation which where Putin could decide he's going to attack a whole range of countries. And of course, he got nuclear weapons. And so they kept putting limits on what they would provide to give Putin an off ramp, as it were. Now, I think. I wish the Americans had not been so cautious with that. I think the point that you made earlier with Orban, which is you take a stance against a bully, you stand up to a bully, and a bully will back down. Um, I wish they had been much more forthcoming in terms of accelerating the aid, in terms of air defense, in terms of air cover, uh, air power, in terms of armor. But I can logically explain why they did it without going to the conspiracy theory that they wanted Ukraine to lose or that they actually wanted a stalemate. And of course, the effect, and I think it's an interesting effect because uh, I'd be interested to hear a take on this. I think we're heading into a less stable rather than a more stable uh, situation as a result of this. And I'll give a, I'll throw a couple of ideas out there and, and, and see what you mm -hmm. think of these. One is 
they have forced Ukraine by not giving Ukraine everything that is required uh, in order to uh, make the counteroffensive successful. And it's not only munitions as well. It's Russia's uh, willingness to to use extreme tactics like the destruction of the Kohovka Dam, which you know blew a big hole in in part of the uh, counteroffensive strategy, mm -hmm. and the period of time where they you know we we just didn't think they they deploy so many mines. So there's various you know mistakes in calculus and then you can say that okay maybe allies are to blame for that and their delays but again it's difficult to foresee all these things however the net result is that by sort of restricting uh ukraine's wiggle room on the conventional battlefield uh ukraine with its extraordinary innovation and ability to think outside the box is saying okay well if we're not going to get this this and this and that allows us to do that that and that well, what else can we do? Because this is a, an existential fight for survival. So Ukraine has clearly developed some extraordinary long range um, technology, drone technology. It's now hitting Russian oil infrastructure, to your point earlier. You know, this is this is could be seen as an extraordinary escalatory inverted commas measure. But it's an absolutely essential tactic towards a Ukrainian victory in Ukrainian terms. And it's one which they are not dependent on their allies or their red lines to achieve. Same with the sea drones. You know, that that that's a technology I'm sure the US is aware of the development, but actually the deployment of that, the choice of targets, Ukraine has created a space where it can define the parameters of the battlefield. So that's that's great, but you could say that that's escalation which is completely outside control of the u.s strategy um then you have russia on the other side they cannot escalate uh really without using nuclear weapons because they're exhausting their supply of of equipment and their equipment isn't that great or that accurate so what do we see happening we see uh, wars conflagrations hybrid military operations around the world we could we could perhaps even throw the Middle East into that into that pot as well. You and again, I'm we'll, we'll maybe tackle this separately. But the U.S. border issue and the huge spike in immigrants that are hitting that border, extraordinary timing there. And actually, we've seen Belarus and other countries deploy refugees as a way of creating or setting the information agenda. So on the other hand, you've also got Russia. Um, potentially moving into an extreme chaotic and escalatory stage. Uh, neither of these seem to fit with this idea that we can control and contain the conflict. Rather, it spills out everywhere the more you try to regulate it. I read it slightly differently. Um, and that is, let me, let me give you an inside story here. A, the Americans knew the Ukrainians were going to hit deep into uh Russian territory. They just didn't want it to be with U.S. supplied long-range missiles, which the Russians would say, ah, oh, look, it's Washington hitting us. So the Americans knew this. But what I think, you know, where the, the, the Achilles heel of that has been is, is, the, is that some American thinkers, I suspect, especially on the political side, well, you know, if the Ukrainian, if Ukraine can hit Russia deep and they can hit the oil installations and they can hit the air bases, um, then then why should we really push hard to give them what they need on the front line on the battlefield because they can use this tactic instead? And that, of course, was you know fantasy. I think because I, you need both. You need to be able that that Ukraine is strong on the front lines and they have the capacity to go to deep into Russia. So that I think is is where it's there in terms of of, of where Putin goes. Yeah, I, I I always want to be careful. I'd be interested in talk in talking to you about a little bit of, of this kaleidoscope of conflicts we face, which is. It's a little bit, I think, too, we fall into a trap if we say, well, you know, Vlad could be encouraging, you know, folks to grow across the southern border in Mexico and, you know, be they migrants, be they be they asylum seekers, because, you know, that, that's part of his warfare, because that'll feed into a narrative of those who really want to take harsh measures on the border, right? Um, instead of doing that, let's look at what he has done, where we've got the evidence, and that is, Back in 2021, even before uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, Russia tried to push uh, migrants and asylum seekers across the border into Poland. Uh, Belarus, of course, was also involved in that stunt as well because they really wanted to put pressure on Poland. And more recently, 
uh, in the past few months, they've been trying to push uh, migrants and asylum seekers across the border into FEMA. Um, and because it presents a difficult choice, you know, when you actually say, well, you know, asylum seekers should be able to have their cases heard. But what if a state like Russia is trying to overwhelm you know, by sending them all across at once? And Finland responded by shutting down the border post, which you know was understandable. So in other words, I, again, I think Putin does pursue hybrid warfare. We talked a lot about informational warfare already and propaganda. Uh, he would love to pursue other forms of economic warfare if he had the capacity, which he really doesn't at this point. Um, so he resorts to these other tactics to try to destabilize. And, and I prefer to you know, keep that focus on, on that step, on a step-by-step -step basis in analyst. Because I gotta be honest with you, I, I actually think that by doing that, we actually realize that uh, Putin is not this colossus in terms of what he can pull off now. Uh, that for all of that military hardware that Russia has, it's unable to defeat Ukraine. Um, you know, the whole lineup, you know, what was supposedly the second greatest army in the world is the second greatest army inside Ukraine, in fact. But he also doesn't really have the economic and, and political leverage. If anything, Russia is largely isolated these days. When, you're, when your chief allies to keep you going are North Korea and Iran, not exactly winning across all fronts. This is not to underestimate Putin. I repeat, the threat is still there in terms of the information space, in terms of interference in other countries' electoral processes. But it means we can be realistic about what we're facing. And of course, there's a degree of uncertainty, isn't there? I mean, uh, uh, propaganda narratives cannot just create a lie from nothing. They often will leverage issues that are already present. Uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons why Trump has been so su successful in a way. He's addressed real, genuine social issues and economic issues, uh, especially ones that are perhaps under-addressed or which the constituents that voted for him feel they have perhaps been abandoned by traditional politics. This is incredibly fertile ground, isn't it, for Russian propaganda? And we see, you know, no matter what sphere you look at, you will be able to find these kind of wedge issues or fractures in relationships, which will allow Russia a bit of a, a way in. It will, of course, always exaggerate its influence in those situations and uh, exaggerate its supposed successes there. Um, but if we turn away from, you know, the traditional warfare more into sort of hybrid and informational warfare, do you think Russia has been far more effective at leveraging uh, international bodies or rather in, you know, wrapping them in, in, in inertia, as it were, um, than it has been in, in the conventional sense of warfare? I don't. And I want to puncture the media narrative that, you know, the Russians have got all, you know, all this influence and the Russians are on the incident and what they could do. And, and I can just tick this off in a variety of cases. Let's talk about, let's talk about supposedly the Russian-Chinese relationship. Um, China pursuing its own interests. There have been individual Chinese companies that have provided some military equipment to Russia. China is quite happy to take Russian oil and dis uh, gas, especially at a discount, and to do that. But in terms of providing a political and military backstop for Russia, China has distinctly refused to do that. So that's quite significant when you talk about one of the greatest modern hoaxes in terms of politics, which is BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. This will be the bloc, right? This is the new bloc that will basically dominate in a de-dollarized global, global environment. No, it will not, uh, because China's not gonna be really linked up with you. Uh, South Africa has got its own interest, and uh, especially right now, South Africa's taking a prominent role in terms of the Israel-Gaza conflict, presenting the case for sort of the ICJ about genocide. Uh, but South Africa is not carried water for Russia in terms of what the Russians are doing in Africa. Uh, indeed, the South Africans have distinctly stood aside from it. India has reduced its purchases of Russian oil sharply in the last few months. There are serious problems in terms of the convertibility of currencies between the ruble and the Indian rupee, which are affecting that. And Brazil, under Lula, they'll criticize the West. We know they criticize it, but they're not forming part of a block with Russia to go out and sweep across the world, right? 
In other words, the specter of an alternative economic and political system with Russia at the forefront is one which is chiefly put out by a group of Western activists who simply are doing reductionist politics, which is you either choose America or you choose someone that stands against America. Again, I'll name names if you want, because I encounter them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, we, and we saw that, Nicole. That's not a new trope that you pick your camp or the other camp. The point here is, is that most countries are not choosing Russia to be a hegemon. Most countries are not choosing the U.S. to be a hegemon. Most countries, what they would like is, they'd like a sense of order. They'd like a sense of security and a sense of stability. And for most countries, for all of Vladimir Putin's informational warfare, he is not seen as being someone who provides security. The opposite. That's why you've had a series of UN votes against the Russian, the Russians and against their invasion. That's why you have the International Court of Justice, which is arrest warrants against Vladimir Putin and his children's rights commissioner over the deportation. That's why you have a series of economic bodies who have joined the sanctions to put it in. In other words, you know, I wouldn't call Putin an emperor because that's what he would like to say is. But if you want to put clothes on Vladimir Putin, it is not the clothes of a ruler. It's the clothes of someone, the dark clothes of someone who actually ripped up the stability and security. And there's always been threats to that, but he ripped up the stability and security that we had in Europe or have had to a degree since 45. And he did it willingly. And that has been exposed. That's a fascinating point because... I definitely wanted to sort of throw this towards you where where countries don't explicitly uh, criticize Russia. Russia takes that as an endorsement, you know, and it'll make a big play out of that. But actually, this is an important point, isn't it? That even within the BRICS and China to an extent, you know, its stability and wealth uh, depends on a degree of order. It may be slightly different from, yeah. uh, you know, the US-led international order, but essentially it's a form of order. And, uh, you know, without that order, there'd be serious social and economic repercussions in, um, in China. Uh, Brazil and other countries, you know, they might want a different order, but what they don't want is disorder or instability or insecurity. It seems to me, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, that Russia's business model is insecurity. Russia's business model or ideal business model is informal vertical power relations. It doesn't need rule of law. It doesn't need the same sort of structures because it's not a complex manufacturing economy based on treaties, uh, rule of law, trust, any of these kind of things, or even a complex set of legislation governing uh you know, products and, and how they work and how they look and quality standards. It is simply a vast uh, energy exporting um, uh, economy. And, and it's quite happy to export that stuff uh, illegally uh, because they can skim more off the top as they're currently doing amongst the elite. But that's a peculiarly Russian business model. I mean, what other countries would like to see a world like that? I'm, I'm guessing it's not that many. I mean, you probably have some viewers that are shouting, you know, it, as they're watching this now, shouting Shanghai, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which would be a case where, okay, Russia and China are involved in a significant organization um, in terms of organizing Asian countries um, uh, for economic, uh, political progress that takes place. And they'd be absolutely right. The DSEO would offer a vehicle up there. So not everything or blocks that are quote Western blocks, right? If you take, for example, you know, you have APEC, for example, you know, the Asia Pacific Economic Community. Point here is, is that Russia had an option of pursuing through the SCO and trying to navigate with China's economic strategy, which of course is the Belt and Road Initiative, which of course is the idea of China expanding that alternative economic zone beyond Asia and other parts of the world. And on February 24th, 2022, Vladimir Putin effectively undercut the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. That was no longer his priority. His priority became crushing Ukraine. Had Russia crushed Ukraine quickly, then perhaps he would have gone back to the SCO. He would have gone back to other 
multilateral links in Benin, but they weren't able to do that. And at that point, his priority on a day-to-day -day basis for almost two years has been, what am I going to do on the Ukrainian battlefield? And that's not a stable situation for anyone. And, and that's why the Chinese pulled it. That's why he tried to court the Saudis at, at one point, right? Uh, in fact, Putin's been trying to court, court the Saudis for years. And the Saudis are keeping a very low profile in terms of what they do with the Russians. They have to work together in OPEC. We can talk about that. But certainly the Saudis don't see Putin as being a stabilizing factor there. He has completely, and this is an interesting point, completely shredded the relationship with Israel, which had become an important relationship for Russia because of Syria. When Russia propped up Syria and Putin courting Netanyahu, that's gone now. And in fact, Israel and Russian relations are at a very, very low point. You know, and for those, you know, for those tankies who support the Kremlin, that's a good thing because they can bash Israel and still be on Vlad's side at this point. But it, again, we could work around this in terms of all the dynamics. But you will notice that a lot of the people who put out the lines that supposedly the Kremlin is in the Senate from his winning, they don't actually talk about Russia. They talk about the West and the purported weaknesses of the West. That's the tactics. But if you're able to take it back and look at Russia, you realize that, no, that this is not a country which is in the ascendant. This is a country which is actually scrambling now. Um, and I'll add one other point, again, in case there are viewers out there that are yelling at. Yes, Russia has had, on the basis of the economic, if you just simply look at GDP, Russia has had an economy that has had an increase in GDP. But the Russian increase in GDP has been because they have shifted to a wartime economy where they are spending a massive amount of money on producing goods, for example, for the military and for an economy to support itself during a war. The knock-on effects of that are the longer-term effects, which are inflation, which are possibly currency fluctuations, which are deficits in the trade balance. In other words, Russia is spending now and has an artificial bump in its economy because it's effectively mortgaging itself in terms of what happens five, 10 years from now. Again, all tied to the fact that it's Ukraine or bust. And that means there's a very big bump in the road coming up. And I think this is, and if I take the the sum total of sort of your answers, it sounds like you're more, uh, you know, you're, you're, I wouldn't say optimistic, but certainly you see a way forward here for uh, Ukraine. It also sounds to me like you're suggesting that Russia certainly isn't the all-powerful uh, entity that it tries to project through its sort of propaganda facade, um, and that there are some serious systemic problems that could mean Russia crumbles before the West and before Ukraine does, uh, even if this war, which is possible, stretches through this year and into next year. Yeah, I'm, you're being very kind. <laughs> you make me sound logical here, but I always want to be conscious, and I want to explain why, in terms of making big picture projections in, in terms of what happens. Um, what I'm really outlining to you is, is that, for me, in fact, this is neither a case of... Uh, Russia winner, Russia loser here, Ukraine loser, Ukraine winner here. This is a situation which is an ongoing situation. Uh, and as I said, marathon, not a sprint. And it's almost trying to prepare people for that that takes place. And the reason also why I do that is a, a personal reason which comes down to it. And that is the starting point for this is, is that because of the choice of one man and a group around him, Vladimir Putin, um, many hundreds of thousands of people are dead two years later. Uh, hundreds of thousands of them happen to be Russian forces, troops. Hundreds of thousands of them probably happen to be Ukrainian forces, certainly in the high tens of thousands. Many tens of thousands of civilians have been killed. Uh, millions have been displaced and still can't go back home. I always start now with what happened to, to people because of that choice that took place. Um, no one has won from what Putin decided to do. 
but at the same time, while staying away from those big projections to emphasize that, saying that no one has won by focusing on those who have lost, who have been killed, or who have lost family members, or have lost their homes, or lost their livelihoods, is a reminder that simply putting out a simple narrative that says it's all NATO's fault, it's all the West's fault, it's all the fault of the United States and American hegemony, whatever. Okay. You can spend that out there, but you actually are doing a disservice to us as people who should care about the cost of what has been waged. And if you ever have me back on, for example, to discuss Israel-Gaza, mm. I'll do the same thing, which says that uh, for those who like to throw around who wins, who loses, who's the angel, who's the devil, the fact of the matter is, is that when more than a thousand people lost their lives on October the 7th, because Hamas decided to cross the border and to carry out mass murder, which is what it was. And when more than 27,000 have died in Gaza since October 7th, and the toll is likely to be far higher, but when more than 20,000 were confirmed to have died since October 7th, because the Israeli military and its leadership decided to carry out mass killings. That's the story in point. Those people perished because various groups decided they would try to seize power or try to poke someone else in the eye. And they didn't give a damn. They didn't give a damn about humanity when they did it. I think that's that's, that's an incredible. We'll definitely do a whole episode on that. I know it's a can of worms I've been putting off uh, talking about that whole situation. We've touched upon it just around the propaganda. But this is an important point. And this is the, last, the very last uh, sort of question here. Mm -hmm. um, and it really it probably requires just a, a short answer there. The suffering, and I don't think on the channel we try to unplay the suffering at all, but one way of tackling the propaganda narratives to say that Ukraine has lost so much. But if they hadn't resisted, and in fact, if they aren't supplied to carry on resisting, they could yet lose far far more. It's 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 not that the suffering has has, has reached a pinnacle. There is still the potential for vast amounts of suffering. And I think the questions we ask every day on the channel are aimed at how can we prevent that scale of further suffering on the Ukrainian side? I mean, I would I would like in a, in a, in a, in a future self to care as much for the Russian soldiers. At this point, my primary care is solely with, with Ukraine and how it can minimize further trauma. Anyone who wants to make comments, and please do, you know, not just for the sake of the algorithm, but for the sake of discussion, wants to make comments. Before you make that comment, think about what happened in Busha, just outside of Kiev, in March of 2022, when Russian forces wiped out, killed hundreds of civilians just because they were Ukrainian. Think about Erpin outside of Russia or outside of Kiev when Russian forces killed civilians in that territory. Think about those civilians who were killed day on day in missile strikes because the Russians have been indiscriminate in terms of what they want to attack. Think about that. Think about what that's like on a day-to-day -day existence. Think about the Ukrainians who are now in Russia, including Ukrainian children, and cannot get back before you make that comment. And then think about this before you make a comment. Go read what Vladimir Putin said in July, 2021, in a lengthy essay that he put out for the Russian people, but also put out as a signal for the international community. Where he says in that essay that Ukraine is not a nation. Ukraine has no existence. Ukrainians only are there to be part of greater Russia. Think about that. Before you tell me that NATO and the West took the lives of those civilians, think about who wanted Ukraine to be eliminated. Think about Vladimir Solovyov, if you haven't heard of him yet, who on Russian state TV, night after night after night, post people that talk about Ukrainians as vermin. 
I'm not going to make the obvious comparison with where that has happened in the past. But you think about it in terms of this context. And then don't just make the comment to me on this channel. Go and say that to the face of someone from Ukraine and tell them that it was their fault or the West's fault for all they've lost. Then drop me a line. That's very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing those insights on the channel, Scott. I hope we get a ton of uh, debate there. Uh, encourage people to keep it polite, but they can be as impassioned as they like as well. Um, thank you so much. And we'll definitely speak again. And we'll we'll, we'll do that uh, episode on the Middle East, which, uh, you know, I really want to get my uh, my head around some of the issues and not put any, you know, inject any generalizations and falsehoods into the debate. Uh, but I definitely do look forward to that. Thank you so much. Onwards and upwards.